Good afternoon. How, is everyone still awake? <laughs> How many people are Fire Films members here? Well, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's pretty good. So it's like 25%. Um, we started at the Fire Conference in 2009 by showing a film that I saw at Sundance called The Cove. And it moved me so deeply that I thought, what if we bring a film to our conference? with all these world-changing technology leaders in the BBC and, uh, and see what happens. And we did. And I watched, uh, Elon was there, um, Paul Allen was there, the BBC was there, and I watched our audience become completely moved to say to action, what can we do? And that's where I realized that we need to bring a film every year to this powerful audience that we select that we can do something about that can change the world. So Fire Film members um, are now receiving 18, on an average, documentaries by email with the director's statement of why I made the film and what I want to see happen to the film. Um, and so I would love for you to join if you want to outside. Um, you'll see there's a table. If you'd like to be part of our team, uh, please do. I am so honored today, first of all. Um, by Skype, we have James Redford, and uh, Jamie, I've known for about, hi Jamie, I've known for about two years. And uh, he's a really magnificent filmmaker. Uh, he's, I'm sure you've uh, seen some of the films he's made. His film Resilience was about, is about the biology of stress and the science of hope and has 40,000 community screenings already. Uh, his documenting, documentary Happening, A Clean Energy Revolution is his most recent film, you should watch that. And uh, Jamie's with us. And Jamie, what I'd like to do is show the clip first of Resilience and then talk to you about, um, ask you some questions about it. So, Scott, let's roll. The reality is that we all need a certain amount of stress, a certain amount of anxiety to perform well. If we don't care about that exam that we're going to have tomorrow, we'll probably fail. If we're going to cross the street and a truck is coming at us, we have release of adrenaline. We have release of a hormone that we call cortisol. We want to jump out of there, and adrenaline and cortisol are going to help us do that. So there's that good amount of stress. But if all day long you're feeling like a truck is coming at you, day after day after day, that's going to take a toll on the body. And uh, the amygdala obviously here is has greater activation yes. in the PTSD. We were able to image children that had experienced trauma and compare those brain images with children that didn't have an experience of trauma and didn't have symptoms. Right, an exaggerated fear response. An exaggerated fear response. With decreased activation in areas that we need to control that emotion in the frontal areas. Exposure to early adversity and trauma literally affects the structure and function of children's developing brains. So the kid next to them hits them or the teacher reprimands them in a way that uh, they're uncomfortable with, right? Literally what they're feeling, that activation, is like there was a truck coming at them. I have to say hello to Jim. Yay! <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really cool panel we have here. So, Jamie, what inspired you to make that film? Well, uh, I do. I was thinking about this today. The majority of my documentaries have have been rooted in solid but unknown science, um, and uh, in this case, it was really the science of adverse childhood experiences that was published in the mid '90s that made an undeniable link between early childhood traumas that, were, that go unaddressed and health problems later in life. Um, and that's even if you eliminate the negative behaviors that are often um, develop as a result of you know, dealing with the stress of, of, uh, of trauma in childhood. Once you remove those things like drinking, smoking, too much of, 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 of those things, you still have negative impacts. And that, that simple reality, when I read it, it was just, oh wow, uh, why aren't we talking about this? 
what's going on. And for me, those kinds of moments are, are what makes me crazy enough to do these things. So it's really interesting. So I think that we all can relate to that. Uh, we, none of us have perfect families, and, and we see the things, see how we result physically later on in life with, with the results of the stress from whatever happens. If you could show this film to the world, what would you like to have happen as a result of your work? Well, you know, given the fact that there, it, it, it is rooted in such good science, the, the, the best thing is actually not that complicated. It's, it's really a way of trying to give people a deeper and better understanding of the power of compassion and human connection to help heal from traumatic events. Um, the big problem with children is very often the way traumatic events uh, affect them uh, you very often, it, it, their behavior, the irony is that the very children that could really use compassion and one caring adult most um, are the ones that, that tend to push people away with difficult behavior. And so if it, whether you're a teacher or a pediatrician or a police officer or a juvenile judge, um, you know, all those in the social fabric that are dealing with children's wellness, they really have to understand that these are symptoms of something far deeper that compassion can do a lot to make up for. Thank you. And I want to also add that Jamie is making a documentary about people that are involved in Project Apollo and we're really honored to have that happen. So thank you, Jamie. So good to see you. Good to Take see care you. Of Sorry I can't be there. Have a good day. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye bye. Uh, the next person I'd love to introduce you to is um, one of my favorite people in the world that I respect with <laughs> tremendously. Um, James Baylog and Luis Hoyos, to me, together, um, are two people that have put their lives, their hearts, their soul into the most important things that are happening in our world um, to try to prevent us from imploding, uh, to try to uh, help us survive. Um, James Baylog, you probably all know this, um, Chasing Ice was uh, directed by Jeff Orlowski, and this was uh, the film was about James, James' work on the glaciers with his time lapse photography. Uh, has, how many people have seen Chasing Ice? Oh yeah, okay, good. Most of you, right? That was our Fire 2012 feature film, and everyone loved it so much that one of our key partners said, "Would you please come out to California and let's do a private screening and a fundraiser to help help keep James' work going?" Um, you know, when the glaciers melt the time-lapse photography, you've got to move the cameras, you've got to change the cameras out, and, and there's a team of people that have to do that, so it's really important to keep on funding that. Uh, James, as you know, is an environmental photography. Um, he's the founder and director of the Earth, Earth Vision Institute and the Extreme Ice Survey. His new documentary is what we're talking about today, The Human Element, which is his film. No director, you're writing this whole thing. This is your baby. Um, congratulations. I've seen it, um, uh, is a, a very powerful film that we're going to be watching tonight. This is tonight's fire featured film at 7 o'clock. Please be here for it. You will not want to miss this. Um, let's show the trailer. Okay, guys. Are you guys ready to brush your teeth? Let's go. Come on. Come on, guys. Okay. Okay, I need you to take your medicine, guys. Ready? Let's go. Slow. Slower, please. Slower. Good job. Ready? Good job. So, you're going too fast, honey. After we moved to this part of town, my older son, Ruben, started developing asthma. My daughter, Olivia, we had to start her on medications at the age of one, and Leonardo was just kind of born into it. Okay, good job. Now go rinse your mouth really good, please. All four of us have asthma. So we're indoor people. We're not outdoor people. The pollution here in the neighborhood is pretty extreme. And, you know, we have the refinery. 
and all of the pollution from the semis that pass through. Asthma is a normal thing in this part of town. One of the questions that a lot of people have asked is, why haven't you moved? Why, why don't you just move? Because moving takes money. Okay. Bye. Okay, be careful, son, please. When your children have asthma, you become, I don't know, paranoid. You're most definitely afraid of the air that you're breathing in. Because although you need it to survive, that same air is also killing you and your family. When Olivia and Leonardo became of age to go to school, I put them where there is extra help for children with asthma. Hey, dude. Our students had trouble in typical schools because they would often miss 40, 80 days of school year just trying to get medical care. So they come to us, they have illnesses such as severe asthma. Some of the kids have other illnesses along with that, but the majority of our kids are struggling with air. Okay, Emily. Our nurses do a really good job of taking care of our kids, but if they are triggered by pollution, they can end up in the hospital and it's, it's even life-threatening. So yeah, all the kids have their little boxes and they've got their little pictures on them. And then the nurses train the kids to come in here and know what to do. So how often would this child be coming in here during the school day? About four times. Really? Five if wow. they're sick, yeah. They need meds five times a day during the school day. Has the incidence of attack on the kids gotten worse, or is it the same? Or I mean, anecdotally, based yes, on your experience, yeah, exactly. What? Um, and I've been a school nurse for a long time, and in fact, about 18 years. But there has been an increase in the amount of identified kids with asthma. Definitely, really, that's absolutely true. Yeah. For most asthmatics, air pollution is a major trigger, and so you see a lot more asthma attacks in areas where there's a higher pollution level. Thank you. So James, what inspires you to make this film? You know, it's the same as, as everything, really. We're, we're living in this historic moment of change in the natural systems around us. And as a, as a photographer, as a, a scientist, as a living citizen on this planet, I feel an obligation to bear witness to it, to these changes. You know, these, these changes are not a hypothetical for the distant future. We're in the middle of them right now. And if you have a camera in your hands, all you have to do is, you know, open your eyes and show up. And there's an important story there to witness. James, and I talked a little earlier and uh, talking about the things that he sees that are so difficult to see, um, so painful to watch, to experience, and, and for him to dive into this now for the second time, whether you're talking about chasing ice or now the human element, I mean, it really takes a toll. Um, and and, and uh, we were talking about, you know, he has seen these changes and he feels a responsibility, as I know that a lot of people do, if you go through and see something that's tragic, um, instead of just let that go, you need to teach others about it. And I think, and I really respect you tremendously because you're keeping on doing it and it's a really tough job. Uh, most people think that filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, make a lot of money. Um, and I remember talking to our Fire Films ambassador. <laughs> I remember talking to Gerald and Dreyfus. Um, and, and, you know, I, I used to think that they did too. I thought, oh man, you know, rich, popular, famous for good stuff. And I, the more I learned and met new directors, the more I uh, finally understood that filmmakers probably know more about the subject than anybody else. And they lose, an, on an average, $1 million per film. One million per film. So the heart is in the film, and I feel that we all need to know this and to truly try to support the filmmakers by donating in whatever way possible. What would you like to see happen as a result of your film? Well, we're 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 you know doing here what we've been doing around the country and and in Europe uh, and Asia. Actually, we've got an outreach program this week in New Zealand 
sponsored by some very influential business folks in New Zealand. Um, so we, we just want to tell the story as far and wide as possible and just use it as another little piece of uh, evidence to alter perception and to help the society shift into a different and better direction. And to prepare our children for what is to come. Yeah, I, you know, some of these stories I almost don't like to show to children mm -hmm. because especially, you know, the, this film, The Human Element, it's got some pretty dark uh, times in it right. uh, that I think are overwhelming for kids. Yeah. They don't have the, the mental resilience, to use Jamie's uh, term, mm -hmm. to, uh, to absorb this and realize that they're not totally ruined, <laughs> yeah. uh, that their future isn't totally ruined by the future, uh, by, the, by the world that we're showing. But nevertheless, uh, you know, my eventual hope is to give inspiration, give excitement through the information mm -hmm. to uh, effect positive change. What do you think uh, about your next film? Are you thinking about the next subject? I'm really thinking about pushing this film out as far and wide as possible. That's where all the energy is going. And I have, uh, I have a lot of ideas rolling around in my head, including going back uh, and working on ice again. I was yeah. just on an icebreaker, a Russian icebreaker, to the North Pole this summer. And uh, that experience really showed me that there's a, 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 a really creative and interesting way to tell the Arctic sea ice story, mm -hmm. which is something we did not touch right. on in Chasing Ice. And, uh, but, but it's a historically incredibly important story because that Arctic pack ice is going away. Uh, so we're thinking of maybe doing a, 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 not exactly a sequel, but a new version of Chasing Ice. Uh, we'll, we'll just see. I need to breathe. I need some R&R &R right now, too. And, um, yeah. you know, we'll get to it when we get to it. Chasing Ice, when we showed this uh, in 2012, um, one of our partners, Oracle, um, was very moved by the film and invited us to do a fundraiser at Oracle facility. Um, and we are, Fire Films would like to do more of this. And so if any of you are interested in talking with me and with James about hosting a screening at your corporation uh, or at your smaller company, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, this is the way to get the word out to the people. And we do need to create funding to keep on helping him to, to make the films that he's making. Well, that's a very nice pitch. Thank you. <laughs> Never expected that. And Bill needs it, too. We all need it. <laughs> Bill Neal. Um, I met Bill Neal in Park City um, at, um, I, it must have been something about whales, um, and I was, I was, I think I was hosting a panel uh, about, about animals, and you came up to me and you said, I'm writing, I'm, I'm making a documentary about whales, and so we started talking three or four years ago, and, and um, right now, he's, he's self-funding this film, uh, and it's called Long Gone Wild, and it's about the plight of the captive killer whales. Uh, has anybody seen Blackfish? Yeah, that's a tough one, right? And this picks up uh, after Blackfish uh, about <clears throat> what's happening and there's possibilities of developing whale sanctuaries for those whales that are still in captivity that can't go out into the wild ocean themselves, but they can be in the ocean with some form of netting to protect them, to be able to end their lives in, in a semi-natural state. <clears throat> Bill is also a, a writer. His first novel, Rogue Justice, was about killer whales, and Bill's been fascinated by them uh, always, and as you'll see um, in, in the clip that we'll show uh, coming up right now. And I think if, as anybody who's ever seen whales out uh, in the ocean naturally, uh, they're breathtaking, and on top of that, they are as smart, if not smarter, than we are. So let's roll the clip. Blackfish exceeded expectation. We never could have predicted the influence and the depth which, with which it's penetrated the culture. Fifty, sixty, a hundred acres of water space that you can net off where a whale can be provided lifetime care 
24-7 veterinarian on call if needed, but no requirement to perform. Да, они уехали. Здесь система построена так, что... This is a lucrative business. It is wildlife trade. There's nothing worse but the drug trade when you're talking about scary. Digit increases in numbers of facilities from year to year. It's frightening how fast they're building these places. This matches exactly the coordinates, the GPS coordinates. This is it. We're there. The Yorkers are here someplace. With that kind of money, there's potential inevitability, I should say, for corruption in two places that are notoriously corrupt, Russia and China. It's good to see Rick O'Berry in your film. Ah, uh, Rick, yeah. <laughs> So we, what inspired we actually, you? We actually got uh, picked up by security right after you. I bet you did. Oh, we did. We, we thought we were going to end up in a gulag, so anyway. <laughs> Pulling a Paul Watson? Yeah. <laughs> so so um, tell me what inspired you to make this film? Uh, well, first of all, Sharon, I want to thank you for being a part of this great conference and to share a stage with uh, these two great filmmakers, the two James and Eliza is doing some great work, so I want to thank you for that. It's an amazing group of people here. Um, you know, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be determined by the way it treats its animals. And I think that's so true, and I've always been an animal mm -hmm. lover. Um, I, you mentioned the book, I've been interested in killer whales for a long time. And <clears throat> when blackfish came along, um, I think that just cemented um, my passion to do something on behalf of the orcas. As you saw in the uh, trailer, um, many people think that because of blackfish, everything was fine and the orcas are free and and they're not. The 22 orcas are still there, and SeaWorld um, is adamant that they remain there. So we want to do our best now that there is a place to go. The SeaWorld and other uh, parks have always maintained that the, you can't let the, they can't release the whales because there's nowhere for them to go. They cannot go back to the ocean. Many of them were born in captivity. And they had a valid point about that. Now they don't because of the Whale Sanctuary Project and the amazing, I mean, it is literally a dream team of people on the Whale Sanctuary Project. So there is a, not, there is a place for the whales to go now and we want to stress to SeaWorld, finally let these magnificent sentient animals out of these concrete pools they certainly don't belong there. The other two, op the other two elements are, of course, Russia and China. Right. And it's just, I can't stress enough how um, ominous the future is for orcas if this, what's going on in China now, they have 58 parks, 
If you think of it at its height, SeaWorld had four. They have already had 58 with 20 under construction, 15 orcas in three parks getting ready to perform. It seems like there should be some international organization representing orcas or killer whales to stop this from happening. And rather than wonderful. just find the sanctuary, there needs, needs to be some means of uh, some legal team to be able to say this can't happen anymore. Right. And what would you like to have happen as a result of seeing this film? Well, we'd like to, we'd like, as I just said, we'd like to uh, stress to SeaWorld that, you know, it's time. Uh, they've been there, you've, you, you've been earning millions off of these whales for 50 years. It's time that they be retired to a sanctuary. They can't go back to the ocean, they could be retired. But also, and also to raise uh, awareness of what's going on in Russia and China because it is truly uh, ominous. And this goes with, with dolphins as well. Right? I'm sorry? With this also, this is the same situation with dolphins. Yes. Yeah, there are many more dolphins and beluga whales than there are orcas in mm -hmm. captivity. But the orcas are the stars of the shows. And mm -hmm. I think if we can get these places, and of course the National Aquarium is making a move with dolphins. They're going to retire them to sea sanctuaries, which is a great move. But I think if we can get SeaWorld and others to release the orcas, to retire the orcas, then I think the dolphins and the beluga whales and other sentient cetaceans will follow. Thank you. Thanks. Eliza McNitt, this is the first time I've met you. It's an honor to meet you. That was really heavy stuff now that here comes the fun stuff. <laughs> Eliza is a writer and a director. Her virtual reality experience, Spheres, Spheres explores the mus music of the cosmos, which is a really interesting statement. Um, this, this series uh, made history at Sundance. It's the first ever major sale of a virtual reality in a landmark seven-figure deal. Um, and she's been all over the world with showing this um, South by Southwest, Sundance, um, Cannes, um, Venice Film Festival. Um, this is the recipient of the grand prize in, in virtual reality uh, at, at this year's Venice Film Festival. And this is not even released yet. It'll be released later this fall, so you're in for a treat. Um, and I want to show this and also to tell you that tomorrow night in my suite, in our suite, um, 316-1 at 8 o'clock we're going to have a VR experience about how it's like and you'll see uh, after we talk um, about what it's like to be in space with VR so let's show the clip So Eliza, uh, tell me what, what inspired you to make this. So when I was uh, 17, I was the two-time winner of the Intel Science and Engineering Fair and uh, for my research on the vanishing of honeybees around the world. And uh, my award was to visit the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And I got to walk inside of the particle accelerator where they smash atoms together in a quest to understand these deep mysteries of the universe. And that's really when I began to wonder, you know, what lies beyond this world that we live on. And, um, you know, one billion years ago, two black holes collided, creating a ripple in the fabric of space-time. And only two years ago, three now, we detected that signal here on Earth. And that was a gravitational wave. And that's something that we, we cannot feel it, we cannot see it. But yet, it was the first time that we heard black holes sing. And it did make a sound that we can actually listen to. 
and I wanted to create a virtual reality exploration of that music that comes from the universe, that you know, we think that space is silent, but it's actually full of sounds. Awesome. And with spheres, for the first time, you get to really listen to that music. Thank you. And to note, um, our breakout session will include these people and uh, two other great filmmakers, including Jenny McKenzie uh, and uh, Diane Tober. So uh, if you want to learn more and see more, we're going to show bigger clips and talk about film. Uh, in, we've got a theater right over here. Um, meet us there for an hour. It'll be really cool. The VR experience is tomorrow night in my suite at o'clock. And um, thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>